Espera. Voy a mirar. ¡No! ¡Pablo, no! Estamos en el ático, Ángela. Puede que haya una no, salida por, por arriba. Tenemos que intentarlo. ¿Qué vas a hacer? ¿Qué vas a hacer? Voy a asomar la cámara y grabaré lo que haya. When you think of horror, what comes to mind? Jump scares, a masked killer, blood and gore, ghosts and demons. All of these are aspects that come from horror, but they barely scratch the surface of what horror is and how it has changed over the years. Horror films are intended to scare, disturb, disgust, and shock their audiences for entertainment. In order for them to be able to accomplish this feat, they need to be constantly evolving to fit within the cultural zeitgeist and be able to prey on the collective fears the audience has at the time. Horror films let audiences face their worst nightmares with the safety of a screen between them and the danger. It is also one of the only genres that is allowed to examine the dark areas of human nature, the raw desires people have and the rage that they hold. They can break the taboos that constrain society. They can show the dangers of technology and the terrifying side effects of science when used incorrectly. Whereas film in general allows you to escape to a new world, horror lets you not only escape but become someone else. They provide a release to those who need it. While horror films date back to the late 19th century when George Millier released his film The Haunted Castle, we're instead going to jump forward 24 years to 1920 and visit Dr. Caligari. An early example of German Expressionism, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is considered by many to be the first true horror film, as well as the first film to have a twist ending. Beautifully designed sets and environs, a staple of German Expressionism, bring the effectiveness of the film to a new level in terms of the themes it provides. As the film was released just after Germany lost World War I, one of the main readings into the themes is that Caligari represents the German war government, with Caesar, the Somnibus, a symbolic of the common man trained to kill. Two years later, horror was given another monumental film, Nosferatu. The film was an unauthorized and unofficial adaptation of Dracula, with many of the details being changed, most prominently setting the film in Germany and changing Count Dracula to Count Orlok. Despite these changes, however, Bram Stoker's widow sued the filmmakers for copyright infringement, and in 1924, a judge ordered all copies of the film to be destroyed. Fortunately, for the history of cinema and horror, a few copies survived as they had already been sent overseas. If not for that, we would not have the iconic imagery from Nosferatu ingrained in our minds today. Throughout the rest of the 20s, even more silent horror films were being released, many of which have been unfortunately lost over the years. And plenty of these silent films became iconic staples in horror, and in some cases, cinema as a whole. It would all change in the 1930s, when Universal released Dracula. Decades before Marvel came around and made cinematic universes the norm, there were the Universal Monsters, a series of films released by Universal from 1931 to 1956. The Universal Monsters each had their own standalone films before eventually crossing over and meeting each other in films like Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, House of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. These films dominated the horror landscape in the 30s and 40s before oversaturating the market, causing audiences to lose interest. But just as the monsters went out, the creature feature B-movies came in. Throughout the 50s, these films ran rampant. World War II was over and people's fears have changed. The gothic wasn't scary anymore. As Meg Shields argues, it's hard to find Dracula scary once you know the atomic bomb exists. These new films of the 50s focused on mangled men, irritated insects, aliens, and beasts. The films were made fast and cheap in order to cash in on the new fears brought by the atomic age and the space age, resulting in occasionally sloppy, campy, but fun creature features that terrified audiences around the world. After all, this is what gave us Godzilla. He's back with a vengeance. Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. How many horror franchises can you name? Probably only a few off the top of your head, but franchises have long been a mainstay of the horror genre, going way back to the Universal Monsters. Studios began to rely on existing properties to bring in audiences, and this was no more apparent than with horror. 
Audiences could see their favorite characters appearing on screen again and again, which has followed for some of the most recognizable icons in cinema history. Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, and Michael Myers are some of the most well-known characters in pop culture, with constant references to them in various media, even if they would sometimes give Jason a chainsaw, a weapon he never used. Hey, do you want to see my new chainsaw and hockey mask? Ah! Oh, sorry. And while there have been very successful franchises in horror, be it franchises dealing with monsters, the Godzilla franchise for instance consists of 38 films released over 70 years, or successful franchises dealing with demons, the Conjuring universe has had 9 films over 10 years, no franchises have been more popular than the slashers. The horror genre is one of the most versatile genres there is, and that allows for many genres to be seamlessly paired with it. Most frequently, you'll see horror with comedy, as the genres are so closely linked. They don't need analysis to see how effective they are, as the feelings you get while watching them tell you all you need to know. Rude fucking doll. Musical is also a surprising, yet satisfying genre pairing with horror. There are a lot of horror musicals, both on screen and on stage, and the reason for that is despite the seemingly formulaic nature of both genres, they are some of the best genres for storytelling, and when all their tropes and strengths combine, they make for truly captivating results. Everybody's dying and it's only hard to live. Even horror and romance can be combined, and these films have been around for a while, but they do seem to be blossoming into more mainstream films. The two genres blend rather seamlessly, giving audiences the ability to feel the emotional effects of the relationship, combined with the terror of the world around them. And within each genre, there are smaller and more specific genres called subgenres, and horror is probably the most prominent user of subgenres, as it's the best way to sort by the type of horror in the film. These subgenres include the most well-known type of horror movie, the slasher, but they also include psychological, giallo, cosmic, found footage, and many more. The subgenres of horror have spawned from some interesting facets as well. Cosmic horror is derived from H.P. Lovecraft stories. Giallo spawned in Italian cinema and tends to be focused on crime and mystery. And found footage, which, while dating back as far as 1972 with The Legend of Boggy Creek, the subgenre rose to greater prominence after films like The Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity came out. It, it, it does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my god! My God. That looks like a second plane. Terrible. Just I didn't see a plane go in. On September 11, 2001, the horror genre would go through one of the most monumental periods of change it has ever experienced. Prior to this date, horror would frequently allow for hope to shine through. There is almost always a way to defeat the evil. Jason, Michael, and Freddy can be killed, though they will return in the next sequel and heroic human qualities such as love, bravery, and resourcefulness help the characters get there. On September 10th, the horror film stopped ending in hope. Now, nihilism, despair, random violence, and death, combined with images generated by the attacks, would gain far greater prominence. We now get films that show that evil will conquer all. Heroic human qualities won't save the day or even defeat the evil anymore. In films like Cloverfield, The Mist, Cabin Fever, The Strangers, and Paranormal Activity. There is no stepping off whole and unhurt. These films end in tragedy. Look at me! Look at me! I love you! I love you! The horror films in this period would indirectly capture and respond to the experience of 9-11. They would also use specific filmmaking techniques which echoed the experience of 9-11. The post-9-11 landscape also led to the birth of what is commonly referred to as torture porn, a subgenre where films like Saw and Hostel are frequently put, despite them not fitting that name. Right off the bat, it needs to be mentioned that the term of torture porn is a horrible one, as it is condescending and degrading to the films it slapped on. The term is generally used by critics when describing films with gruesome kills, but the term itself is referring to the films that kill people to kill people, and have very little plot, and it gets many movies mislabeled. Sure, there are some movies that are more so torture porn, like Hostel 2 and 3, and The Human Centipede 2 and 3, but applying that label to things like the first Hostel or the Saw franchise is just plain wrong. The first Hostel film, for instance, explores the xenophobia that Americans had following 9-11, and the Saw series is full of story and contains an interesting philosophical aspect. Most people are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you. Not anymore. 
The term is especially bad when referring to the first Saw film, which is actually very tame compared to what the series would become. It's similar to the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre in that respect. The violence is implied rather than shown. Now, terrorism isn't solely an American concern. There have always been significant terrorist attacks across the world, and the experience of terror is frequently reflected in cinema. If you look at Japanese horror, there was a rise in films with angry spirits that used technology to kill, following the Tokyo Subway Sarin attacks in 1995. And the experience of terror is shown again when American remakes of these films began popping up following 9-11. It's important to note that the elements, tropes, and themes of post-9-11 horror are not new. New York City has always been a setting where horror frequently takes place. King Kong, Chud, Inferno, and Maniac are all set in the Big Apple, and even Jason takes a trip there in the late 80s. Everybody dies in Night of the Living Dead, The Blair Witch Project, and Pet Cemetery. John Carpenter's The Thing is a film of endless nihilism, paranoia, and hopelessness, where the best outcome is freezing to death. Evil Winds and Rosemary's Baby, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and The Wicker Man, just to name a few. So while post-9-11 horror didn't invent these things, the shift in society following the attacks was echoed in cinema, making these elements occur more frequently. Additionally, while there are horror comedies in the post-9-11 world, the violence is not playful or comedic. The remakes of Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street removed the humor and playfulness that was so common in their later entries. The villains are made out to be real monsters that you don't want to root for. These remakes feature violent, horrible, painful deaths. No longer do we have the kills of Jason X or Dream Warriors, which serve more as comedic beats in their ridiculousness. In the early 2000s, studios were remaking horror classics and forgotten horrors left and right. While remakes have always been a facet of Hollywood, the boom of horror remakes in the early 2000s was something else entirely. There were remakes from all corners of the genre, films like the Amityville Horror, Black Christmas, House of Wax, My Bloody Valentine, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Prom Night were all remade, and that's barely even scratching the surface. There were even remakes made for lesser known horrors like April Fool's Day, The Stepfather, Willard, and The Hitcher. The amount of these remakes that were being pushed out seemed unrelenting, and it went so far that Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson brought back the Scream franchise in order to comment on the trend. These remakes tended to be darker, meaner, and bloodier, but quality was often sacrificed to achieve this as only a few of the remakes are any good, much less better than their original. Fortunately, despite the remakes here and there, the trend has died. Unfortunately, they have been traded in for requels. In today's age of horror, there are more original stories being told than in previous decades, but franchises, sequels, and remakes still reign supreme. The sequels and reboots, however, generally take the form of legacy sequels, sometimes termed requels. These films generally have titles identical to their original, although nicknamed something by fans to tell them apart. Think Halloween, dubbed Halloween 2018, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, dubbed TCM 22, and Scream, dubbed Scream 5. And these films will also generally bring back the final girl or protagonist. Lori, Sally, and Sydney all return to their respective films. These films are typically well received or poorly received with no in between, but they always bring in good numbers, which is why they keep getting made. And speaking of numbers, horror is booming right now at the box office, with the genre being responsible for some of the most profitable and popular films in recent years. Films like Smile, made for $17 million, grossed over $217 million worldwide. Megan, made for $12 million, grossed $181 million worldwide. And Saw X, which was made for $13 million, made $29.3 million worldwide on just its opening weekend. One of the biggest things these films have in common, besides being horror, is that they're made cheap and bring the money in for the studios, making horror one of the most lucrative and reliable genres there is. And Blumhouse is a big reason for this, making a lot of horror films with their low risk high reward business model, giving them big hits without the worry of failure. In recent years, their films Megan, The Black Phone, and Insidious, The Red Door have had some of the highest grossing horror films at the box office for their year of release. Other studios have caught on to this model and are doing the same, with Paramount going as far as creating a new horror division called Paramount Scares. Art horror has also picked up in recent years, providing more stylized horror films to be released, with a lot more meaning and deeper themes hidden within their plots. As times change, so do films, and nowhere is that more apparent than the horror genre. From the earliest horror films to the most recent ones, it's evident that the genre is always adapting. There is no specific formula for making a good horror film, as what scares audiences the most is changing nearly every day. 
Films that were once terrifying to audiences when they came out are now merely unsettling or thrilling to modern audiences. Anything can change what goes into a horror movie, what themes are used, what messages are told. 9-11 showed us that best, with the films being void of all the hope that was present in a majority of the films that came before. If you showed someone from the 80s a modern horror movie, would they find it horrifying or absurd? There's no real way to know, but what we do know is that this ever-changing genre will produce something new every day that surprises even the most die-hard of horror fans.